about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Hillebrand of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will say to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. Shall we open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 18? Picking up where we left off last time in verse 28. John 18, verse 28, where we read, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas, who was uh, the recognized high priest at the time, led him from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, Well, if he were not an evildoer, we would have not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> Great reasoning. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation. And the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. And for this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now chapter 18 begins with Jesus entering the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, minus Judas Iscariot. He would arrive later, also with a detachment of Roman troops and a delegation of Jewish religious rulers. At that point, there were anywhere from 200 to almost 1,500 men who came to arrest Jesus. But as we read last week, even the combined forces of the world, if they had come against Jesus, they'd be no match for him. Look at verse 4 of chapter 18. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Now picture in your mind, there's Jesus with the eleven, and all of a sudden here comes 200 up to 1,500 men with swords and torches and spears. And there's Judas leading them, coming to betray Jesus, to point him out that they might arrest him. And so you got this little band of guys, Jesus and his 11 
special ed group (laughs) and this huge army coming against him. And he takes the initiative and steps forward and says, Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. Notice the word he is in italics. That was inserted by the translator to try to give a little clarification. But really, they should have just kept I am because what he was literally saying was I am the I am. The great I am. He's calling himself Almighty God at this point. And he says, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. They were knocked on their backsides by just the power of God emanating from Jesus. He was letting them know who's in charge. It's not you 1,200, 1,500 men. It's me. And I'm calling the shots here. And so he let them know very clearly that he was the one that was in charge. He was the one in power. And they then he asked them again, who are you seeking? (laughs) And uh, they they said, "Uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Well, at that point, Peter... He stands up. He's willing to fight to the death. He's willing to take on 1,200 men right now. And he draws out a sword, and he tried to cut off a man's head, but only cut off an ear. As you read through Scripture, it appears Peter wasn't that great of a fisherman, and apparently even worse of a swordsman. He tried to cut off a head and got an ear, which then Jesus graciously healed. He picked up the ear, stuck it to the guy's head, and healed him. Some man has commented and said, Jesus is often healing ears that his disciples are impetuously cutting off. I like that. Jesus is always healing ears that you and I are going around cutting off. Well, then we read how at that point Jesus is led to Annas' house, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Annas had been the high priest, but he had fallen out of favor with the Roman government. And in a display of dominance over the Jews, they removed Annas from his position as high priest and installed Caiaphas, his son-in-law. But many of the Jews still recognized Annas as the high priest. So in a sense, there were two high priests at that particular time. Well, while Jesus was at Annas' house, Jesus was illegally tried and illegally tortured. We referred last week to Mark chapter 14, verse 65. Some of them began to spit on him and blindfold him and beat him and say to him, Hey, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Who was it that hit you? If you're the son of God, they blindfold him, spit on him and punched him in the face. Come on, if you're really the son of God, tell me. Who hit you? You know, by the time Jesus got to the cross, the Old Testament remarks that he was marred beyond any man. You looked at Jesus hanging on the cross, you wouldn't have said, is that Jesus? You probably would have said, is that a man? Throughout his beatings and torturings and whippings and all, he was reduced to just a quivering mass of flesh. All out of service for you and me. Beginning with washing feet and ending with laying down his life that man might do to him their very worst. Well, while he was being beaten by the Jewish religious rulers, at that point, Peter is still on the outside. As we read last week, he's warming himself by the enemy's fire. And during that evening, after that one valiant attempt, he kind of went the other way. He began to deny Jesus. Three times he denied that he even knew Jesus. And the third occasion, a rooster crowed. And then he remembered the words of Jesus Earlier that evening, Jesus said to Peter, I tell you the truth, before the night is out, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Peter remembered those words, then went out and wept bitterly. Jesus was then led from Annas' house to Caiaphas's house, where he was again illegally tried and illegally tortured. And that brings us to verse 28, where man's darkest hour continued. Verse one, or verse, uh, uh, verses 28 through 38, 
Jesus is now brought before the Roman governor, a man named Pontius Pilate. And by the way, there's some men and women who really fancy themselves as being very, very intelligent when it comes to biblical things. And they like to study uh, certain writings of certain others who, bring into, who call into question the claims of Scripture. And some of these people, they, they, you might have heard, heard the phrase higher textual criticism. Or maybe you've heard of the group, the Jesus Seminar. And there are other groups who, for whatever reason, are really trying to call into question the claims of Scripture. It used to be believed not long ago that the story of Jonah and Nineveh had to have been a myth, not because of the whale, but because of the fact that there was no Nineveh. And, and nowhere in the world did they find any ruins with Nineveh until late last century, where in northern Iraq they unearthed this huge city with the words Nineveh everywhere. And so then they had to backtrack. Well, also they called into question this story, this man, Pontius Pilate, because there were no records of a man named Pontius Pilate until 1961, where in the city of Caesarea, the sea coast city in Israel called Caesarea, they were doing some digging and they found the stone. And on it was engraved a huge, it was a huge stone, a huge monument. On it was engraved Pontius Pilate or uh, the Latin Pontius Pilatus. And so that's what it is. And you can, uh, if you go to Israel, you go to the uh, museum in Jerusalem, you can see that stone. If you go to Caesarea, they have a model of that stone set up. And so they've now had to backtrack. Well, okay, maybe he did exist. But beware of those who want to call into question the Bible. Beware of those who want to call into question, especially the miraculous things of the Scripture. They think they're so smart. And they claim that these things never happened, but then later on find out they weren't so smart after all. Just believe the Bible and you'll be safe. You'll be right on. So anyway, Jesus is brought before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Verse 28, they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And the Praetorium, by the way, was a, a fortress, also known as Herod the Great's palace. It was adjacent to the Antonio Fortress. And the Antonio Fortress is, was along the northern wall of the Temple Mount. In fact, it shared that common wall. And in this area was that palace, that praetorium, where the Roman officials would stay when they were on official business there in Jerusalem. And such was the case for Pontius Pilate, he, had, he lived in Caesarea, but on certain occasions, especially for the Jewish festivals, he would come to Jerusalem and he would stay there in the praetorium. So they brought Jesus there, but they, these religious rulers themselves, did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but so that they might eat the Passover. So in other words, they brought Jesus there, but stopped there in the courtyard, handed Jesus over to the Roman guards who then brought him into the praetorium, but they stayed outside. Why? Because they didn't want to become defiled. They knew, according to the law, that if you as a kosher Jew came in contact with something or someone that was unkosher, unclean, then their defilement would be transferred to you. That's why they whitewashed tombs. They, they marked them so clearly so that you wouldn't accidentally step on a grave and thus that, that unclean grave somehow defiling you. So here they were bringing Jesus that he might be condemned and put to death, but yet, no, they're not going to go in and defile themselves. This is what you call straining out a gnat, but swallowing a camel trying to be nitpicky, but yet blowing it on the biggest of levels. Jesus spoke about that when he rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious rulers. He said, you hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint 
and anise and cumin. And yet you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So they would tithe of their spice gardens. God would get one mint leaf. They would keep nine. Tithe means a tenth. God would get one cumin seed. They would keep nine. And, and they were just meticulous, nitpicky in these little teeny things, but yet they missed the big picture. Now, Jesus said, yeah, you should be tithing. You should be. But yet you also should be concerned about the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. He said, you are blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What do you mean by that? Well, to strain out means to make yourself vomit. And basically, he's saying that if you're walking down the road and an unkosher gnat, gnats were unkosher, those certain insects, you could eat like locusts, but certain you couldn't, and gnats fell under the unkosher. Not that I would ever want to eat them anyway. However, God just made it clear they're unkosher. And if some Orthodox Jewish kosher person was walking down the road and accidentally a gnat flew into his mouth, he would bend over, stick his finger down his throat to try to vomit up that, that gnat. But then Jesus said, you're like those who strain it and yet, yet swallow a camel. Camel's also unkosher. I've seen camels, been up close to one. You don't want to eat one anyway. But see, the point he's making is you think you're so righteous because you're so concerned with the meticulous, yet you're missing the big picture. Just like these religious rulers here. They're worried about becoming defiled by stepping into the praetorium. Yet, here they were, delivering up the eternal Son of God that He might be put to death. Talk about blind. Talk about short-sighted. Well, Pilate goes out to them, verse 29, and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? See, the Jews at this point could not execute a criminal on their own. Rome had, in, in their display of dominance, had taken away the right of the Jews to execute condemned criminals. Therefore, if the Jews wanted somebody put to death, they'd have to bring that man to a Roman court of law and bring up a charge that would stick in a Roman court, and then he could be put to death by the Romans. But in Jesus' case... At Annas' house and Caiaphas' house, their verdict, the Jewish verdict, was blasphemy, which was condemn, condemnable by the Jews. Speaking against God, the Jewish law says that person should be put to death. But Rome, they care less about blasphemy. What is that to them? They don't care. So really, when they brought Jesus to Pilate, they, they had no Roman case against him. And that's why they said, when, he, when Pilate said, what accusation to bring against this man? They answered and said to him, they probably looked around and, and uh, well, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> I love that. What a great prosecution. Well, he must be guilty. That's why we brought him to you. Well, Pilate said to him, you know, you, you take him. And judge him according to your own law. Now, the Jews did have the right to punish criminals, just not to put them to death. But therefore, the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus had said he was going to be crucified. Now, it was always God's intention from the very beginning for Jesus to die on the cross. Way back in the Old Testament in the law, we read that an executed criminal could be hanged on a tree as an example for others not to follow. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 22, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree. See, the normal method of execution among the Jews was to stone to death. If you've ever been to Israel, you know why. I mean, stones everywhere. But yet, if you wanted to make him a public example, you could hang him on a tree. But then 
The law goes on to say, but his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged, he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God. Notice that. He who is hanged on a tree, and and not to be left for many days, just even that day to be taken down. You make him an example, but then you bury him. It's interesting that Rome, most of the time, when they would when they would execute a criminal and hang him on a cross, sometimes his body would, and carcass would remain there for many days. But in Jesus' case, he was killed early in the afternoon and buried later that same afternoon. Not allowed to remain overnight. Why? Because the scripture here in Deuteronomy said so. Paul quotes from this verse and says that it also has messianic implications. It's fulfilled In the Messiah. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He's quoting from Deuteronomy. He's saying, Cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus, not that he did anything that brought a curse upon himself, but he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And so cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree. In other words, Jesus, if he was to fulfill the messianic prophecy, he couldn't have been stoned to death. He had to be crucified. Well, the Jews stoned people. How's God going to get him crucified? Well, God made sure that the right of execution was taken away from the Jews. So they would have to go to the Romans. And by the way, the Romans just happened to crucify on a tree their condemned criminals. Coincidence? I think not. I think it was divinely orchestrated by our God. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus even came, the Lord declared that the Messiah was to be put to death by being hanged on a tree, on a cross. And indeed, Jesus was. Well, in the other Gospels we read that The religious rulers are talking, shouting to Pilate, and basically they began to accuse Jesus of insurrection, of trying to lead a revolt against Caesar, which was a Roman capital offense. So they accuse Jesus finally now of of claiming to be a king and of leading an insurrection and of trying to get people to rebel against Rome. Verse 33, Pilate entered the praetorium again called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you claim to be a king? Are you planning to lead a rebellion? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? In other words, do you want to know for yourself about me and my kingdom? Or are you just responding to what others are saying? Well, ultimately, Pilate at this point cared less as to who Jesus was, could care less about Jesus' claims. All he cared about was trying to keep the peace and get these religious rulers off of his back. So he's not interested to know for himself whether or not Jesus is a king, but sorry, Pilate, you must personally deal with this issue, the most important issue that everyone in the world, past, present, and even future, must face. Who is Jesus? Is he who he says he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Is he who he says he is when he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? Is he who he says he is? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Is he the eternal Son of God by whom we must, by faith, believe in him, that we might have eternal life. And nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Is Jesus who he says he is? You determine whether you think he is by whether or not you surrender your life to him. It's not what we say with our mouths. It's what we believe with our hearts that then directs our lives. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart 
that God has raised him from the dead, then you are saved. See, Pilate's just trying to, to keep the peace, but yet notice here Jesus is giving him a golden opportunity to discover who he really is. That Pilate might believe and have eternal life. But Pilate, like so many, is just, he's hearing it and it's, I'm not concerned about that. I don't want to deal with life's big issues. I just want to kind of do my own thing right now. And my thing right now is keeping the peace and getting these Jewish religious rulers off my back. You know, there's so many people that come to church from time to time and they're really not interested in God speaking to the very central core issue of their life. No, they're here because they're, their wife or their husband drug them here or a friend's been badgering them or, or because it's the thing, it's good for the kids. You ever hear that one? Yeah, we're thinking of coming to check out your church because, you know, it's really good for the kids. You know what? It's good for the parents too. And if the parents aren't leading by example, the kids are sure going to see through that. But so often people will come and hear the word of God and they and yet it have no effect on them. Why? Because they're, they're not interested in God dealing with them personally. How about you today? Do you know Jesus is your king? Have you received him as your king? If not, today would be a great day. I can't think of a better day. And after the closing song, or during the closing song, there will be some people up here willing to pray with you. And if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, your king, your master, then you get up from where you are during the closing song and come forward. They'll be here to pray with you. So Jesus asking Pilate, do you want to know for yourself? Or are you just here because you're, you're hearing things from other people and you're just trying to get some information? What's the deal, Pilate? You want to deal with you right now? But Pilate answered and said, verse 35, Am I a Jew? I don't care about these things. I'm not even Jewish. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? See, Pilate at this point is assuming Jesus had to be guilty of something. Since the Jews accused him of claiming to be a king, Pilate's concern was that Jesus might lead a revolt against Rome. And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. You're worried about me leading a revolt. Let me put you at ease. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, earlier, you remember one of Jesus' servants did try to fight. That worked out well, didn't it? Peter drawing the sword and going after the high priest's servant. But notice that Jesus stopped him from proceeding and then even rebuked him. Jesus said, and put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. In other words, Jesus isn't a, a militia leader. He's not calling us to train and arm ourselves to do covert operations to try to overthrow our governments. The last thing on Jesus' heart is for his servants to become militant. But what is but what is on Jesus' heart is for us to embrace the knowledge that his kingdom is not of this world. You know, it's frustrating. I admit, it is frustrating to see our country turning its back on its godly heritage. You know, it used to be that the public school textbook was, guess what? The Bible. That was the textbook of the public school when Thomas Jefferson was president. And you get caught with a Bible on campus now, you can be in trouble. And I wish, I do, I wish that our country or, or even maybe some other country, we could all move there, if some other country decided that the Bible was the one and only supreme authority for society. Wouldn't that be great? But it's never going to happen. It will not happen at least not in this life. For now, Jesus told us that we can expect wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, and, and even a general deterioration until he returns. It's going to get worse. Things will get worse. 
Jesus said, because lawlessness will abound. He's speaking of the very end times, right before he comes back for the church. He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And we see that happening. I think abortion is one of the saddest, most graphic picture of people's love growing ice cold, willing to kill a baby in a womb. You know, people are making a big deal of... uh, of a sports figure recently, dog fighting and all the horrible things that happened, how many dogs were tortured. Hey, that's nothing compared to the atrocity of the whole scale murder of innocent babies throughout our generation. And it's not slowing down. Now, is that sin forgivable? Absolutely, just like any other sin, but there must be repentance recognizing that God is right and that life is his, not ours. And it is a precious gift. And I, for one, who was adopted at birth, am glad that I wasn't aborted. I'll put that out there. I'm glad that, I, in fact, I, I've had two conversations with my biological mother. Did not go well, but that's another story. Anyway, <laughs> I thanked her for not aborting. I said, I don't know what it was like back in 19... But, <laughs> but I'm sure they had places you could go and get an abortion. And she said, yeah. I said, well, I'm glad you didn't. My wife's somewhat glad you didn't. And my kids are glad you didn't. But I think that this might be my opinion and it ought to be yours, I think that abortion is a sign that man's love has grown ice cold in this day. And you know, they're they're looking now to exterminate others who they feel are not of value like the elderly. And uh, those who, who they think their quality of life isn't what it ought to be, so let's go ahead and start knocking them off. One doctor was making a practice of doing so. And it's not going to be long until we see that being legalized. Where when the courts decide somebody's life is not... Well, they did that with that that Terry Schiavo lady. They decided that her life wasn't worth sustaining. And so they starved her to death. Talk about man's love growing ice cold. And when Jesus comes back, there will be hell to pay. What should we do? We should call upon God for mercy. Mercy upon our country. But let's not naively think that we're going to, by electing the right representatives, change things to where we're going to become a Christian nation once again. That's not going to happen. Jesus clearly said, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is in this world, but not of this world. Well, where do we see his kingdom? In you and in me. That's where his kingdom resides, not over some government with a constitution or some charter, but his government, his kingdom rules over the hearts of everyone who claims him as their Savior and Lord. Jesus said, indeed, the kingdom of God is is within you. Not among you, within you. We are his delegates, his representatives. But you know what? His kingdom is not of this world. It's above. That means we're ambassadors. We're just here for the time being. We're passing through. We're in hostile enemy territory, gang. We need to remember that. And when they're enacting laws that make it illegal for us to proclaim the truth, and they're doing that, In Canada already, it's illegal to speak out against homosexuality as being a sin. And in our country, there are state legislations and and congressmen and senators that are drafting hate crimes bills and, and hate crime laws, making it a hate crime to speak negatively against homosexuality or other behaviors. By the way, what crime is not a hate crime? I've always been curious about that. What crime is a 
is not a hate. Aren't they all hate crimes? You commit a crime because you hate somebody else. And so you're going to commit the crime. But it's just another example. We're turning our backs on what God has said. This kingdom is not of this world, but his kingdom is within us. We become citizens of his kingdom the moment we receive Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. We're just passing through, guys. The world is not our home. You know, it's a, a real blessing to live with the same attitude that this world is not our home. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. That's the theme of the women's retreat. We're just passing through. Jesus is coming back very soon. And the closer we get to his return, the worse things are going to get. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but rejoice because I've overcome the world. Our hope is not seeing a better day today. Our hope is in the glorious return of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to come back for us at the moment at the twinkling of an eye, at the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and thus we will always be with him. Our hope is that we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. But it's not of this world. In the world, because Jesus is our king, but not of this world. We're not going to have a Christian utopia on this earth. Not until Jesus comes back. When he does, then, when he comes back and rules and reigns, then we will see the Bible as the supreme authority for all things. And everyone's submissive unto it. Well, verse 37, back to the story here. Jesus talking with Pilate. Pilate examining him. Pilate continues to press Jesus. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? You say your kingdom is not of this world, but okay, are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say rightly, I'm like, you said it, pal. Oh, yeah. And for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus here makes a distinction between those who are of the truth versus those who are not of the truth. Those who are of the truth hear his voice. They agree with him. They embrace what he has to say. They, in fact, their minds are already made up. Everything Jesus says is true. Those are people of the truth. But then there are those who are not of the truth. They argue with. They, they don't agree with. They, they hold at arm's length. Why? Because they're not of the truth, pure and simple. How about you? Are you of the truth or not? Notice what Pilate said. And he sounds like a modern day man of our time. Pilate said to him, what is truth? That existentialistic philosophy. The truth is relative, relative to your opinion. What might be right for you may not be right for somebody else. Truth is not really truth. It's just sincere belief about what you want to believe based on your circumstances today. And who knows, tomorrow... Your measurement of truth might change, might evolve into something else. This is what people of today think. Modern, modern day man, his thinking is that truth is relative. And the, the key truth that they hold on to now is tolerance. I'm sure you've heard that phrase, haven't you? Tolerance. And the key is tolerance, 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 tolerance. What they mean by that is that we would accept anybody and everything and not ever question that what somebody might be doing might be wrong, might not be true, might be a lie. Oh, you know, they want everybody to be tolerant except for those whom they determine to be intolerant. They're not tolerant of them. People like you and me who, who, who believe in absolute truth, who believe that there is a right and there is a wrong, they don't like us. They tell us we need to be tolerant, but why aren't they tolerant of us? I always question that. So Pilate says, what is truth? You're speaking of truth, eh? It's not for me. I want to just believe what I want to believe, so don't bug me with that truth stuff. And then Pilate goes on to make a startling statement. 
showing that his moral compass was still way off. When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. That's it. He's innocent, done, case dismissed. Jesus, you're free to go. At least that's what he should have said. If he found no fault in him, he should have said, case dismissed, free to go. But being the career politician that he was, Pilate tried to pacify the Jewish religious rulers. But you have a custom. And the Jews did have a custom. Every Passover, they would, they would ask for one of their political prisoners to be set free. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And then they all cried out again saying, No, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. In the other Gospels, we also read that he was a thief and a murderer. One who stole, killed, and destroyed. And what fascinates me is that these people, the religious rulers, chose to have a thief, a murderer, and a destroyer in their midst other than the eternal Son of God. You know, to try to make an application here, every person is faced with that same choice. Do you want Jesus or do you want the enemy? It's either or. There's no middle ground. There are no mugwumps in, in God's economy. Do you know what a mugwump is? It's somebody who straddles a fence with their mug facing one way and their wump going the other way, thinking, okay, I got balance here. No. Jesus made it clear you're either for me or you're against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So until we come over to his side, we're still on the other side. Jesus talked about that other side. And he said, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly and also more eternally. So the choice is yours. We're all born sinners, alienated from God. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. So we're all born into the enemy's camp. All born headed for hell. But Jesus gives us the blessed opportunity to get on his side, to come to him, all of us who are weary and heavy laden. And as Jesus promised, he would give us rest. He'll give us eternal life simply by believing in him. Choice is yours. Stay with the enemy who will steal, kill, and destroy, or you can come to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to believe in him today, as I said earlier, during the closing song, come forward. People would love to pray with you. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, your word is true. I pray, God, that each one of us in this place this morning would take that complete step of faith and that we would be convinced in our own minds and hearts that everything you say in your word is true and anything that contradicts is a lie. Because your word is truth and you, Jesus, are the truth. That that would be a settled issue. Lord, as your word says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Lord, if it's a settled issue there, it ought to be settled in our hearts today. Lord, there could be some this morning who have been kind of going in the world, out of the world, and not really committed to you. And maybe even unsure that if they were to die today, that they would or maybe not go to heaven. Lord, I pray that that those questions would get answered this morning. Those confusions would all be cleared up today. That this would be the day when people come to faith in you. The people that all of us, Lord, receive eternal life through faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the date of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m. 
Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.